Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jordan, I'm a second year law student and uh, at Decolonize UK we are committed to giving voices, thank you, we're committed to giving voices and academic voices back to students um, and academics of colour. So it, with, it is with special excitement that I'm pleased to welcome Loki to the Voices of the Unbelonging Conference. He is a rapper, educator, a social justice activist, and a playwright who has produced exceptionally insightful and meaningful work. Loki has written for The Guardian and Ceasefire magazine. His community work around Grenfell led him to become the director of performing arts for the Kids on the Green charity, assisting rehabilitation of children in the area. Additionally, his music has received millions of views and streams on YouTube and Spotify. Loki is someone I have admired since I was 11 years old. I still remember the first time I listened to your music. It was, as, it was as if my mind had become aware of the world around me. It was as if the unconscious became conscious. I was driven to research and read as much as I could. And I don't know if I should say this, but you were in my personal statement to come to university. <laughs> so please welcome me, um, joining Loki to the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about now was I think that sometimes in conversations about decolonization within educational institutions, what people can miss is that paradoxically what we're talking about is actually the inclusion of colonialism within the canon. But what does decolonizing a lot of the things that we take as just completely benign within British society to mean. Actually, that word, the canon, to refer to vital books, who in here knows what the root of that word is? Where did it come from? How did it get into the English language? Who knows? It comes from the Arabic word, al qanun Now, the reason why it comes from al qanun is because Ibn Sina wrote a book called al qanun which was used as a curriculum for medical studies within Western Europe until the 16th century. Hence, in English, the word the canon refers to vital books that one must read. What about if we applied it in other things that we consider just completely normal in our society? Pajamas, anyone know where that word comes from? Yes. T tell, tell, tell us. Precisely. And it was borrowed slash looted <laughs> from India and went into uh, the English language. What about the word jungle? Anyone know what that is a reference to? Again, that is another word that came into English through its presence in India. What about pukka? Pukka, that, that quintessentially English word. Where does that come from? Also, it came into the English language through Britain's presence in India. Even if we look at a word like philosophy, oh, philosophy, <laughs> philosophy. We all know it comes from philosophia, love of wisdom in Greek, right? But what was the bridge between Greek and Latin and English? It's the Arabic language. Felsifa it became in Arabic, and later it came into English as philosophy. So even if we were to attempt to decolonize English words, we would find history in them. And through etymology, you can actually excavate power relations of the past. Because of course, at the time when Al-Qanun was being used as a important medical curriculum for people in Western Europe, the power relations were not quite the same. Orientalism was not a practice used to help in subjugating other people in other places in the world. It was actually an essential practice in order to understand geography. And hence, we have a word like algorithms in the English language. What's the root of that? No, but not far. The root of the word algorithms is an khawarizmi. Al khawarizmi was a Persian polymath who lived in Baghdad in the 900s. 
and who estimated the circumference of the globe in the 900s and was literally only 50 meters off being correct. Now his contributions, along with many others who were thinking in Baghdad at that time, were so considerable that NASA, within the last 10, 20 years, names craters on the moon after these people. But hence the word algorithms is part of English language unproblematically, but it has its roots elsewhere. And there's really so many examples. What I wanted to start with is a quote by someone who I think should be included in all curriculums regarding colonialism, uh, Ngugi Wathiongo, who in his book, Decolonizing the Mind, puts it this way. The physical violence of the battlefield was followed by the psychological violence of the classroom. Where the former was visibly brutal, the latter was visibly gentle. The bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of the spiritual subjugation. Now really the story of British colonialism actually is the story of how a very small island, limited in terms of resource, limited in terms of um, population, geographically not in a massively advanta advantageous place, was able to become the world's number one economic power. That's a bit of an interruption in the equilibrium of world history, isn't it? I mean, let's think about it this way. At the time when the East India Company was founded, in 1600, around 1600, you had a situation where Britain produced just 1.8% of global GDP. India, at that time, produced 23% of world GDP. In fact, Pankaj Mishra puts it this way, the colonies were subjugated by people they had long considered upstarts, if not barbarians. When we look at Let's remember that the East India Company occupied uh, India for around 100 years before the British Army directly got involved. Um, as recently as 1750, you had India and China accounting for 75% of world industrial output. And in fact, as uh, that oracle of economic thought, Adam Smith puts it, in the 18th century, China had a far more sophisticated and developed market than Europe. I mean, let's be honest. China had steel production a millennium and a half before England. It had printed press half a millennium before England. And we know that Cheng Ho, the Muslim admiral for the Chinese Navy, sailed the seas long before de Gama and Columbus. Let's not forget that it was this process of economic development which allowed, between 1757 and 1900, Britain's per capita GDP to increase by 347%. That's astronomical. And let's not forget that my source for that is none other than Niall Ferguson. So not someone that actually thought it was a bad thing. That's someone that thought it was a good thing. Now, this relatively short period of human history, you have seen economic power become concentrated in a small part of the world's population. That's quite the aberration of human history. Now, the industrialization of Britain was based upon the prevention of other societies in the world from development. Um, learning about colonialism is actually learning about London, Bristol, Liverpool. These were vital ports where the commodification of human beings took place and was massively important. Can Bristol have been built without the trade in human beings and um, sugar that those human beings helped to produce? What about Liverpool? Could it have been the Liverpool that we know without the cotton that was produced by human beings in bondage. Because Liverpool as a port was essential to Manchester's industry. Um, you also have to remember that London was an important slave port too. And that those three locations were by no coincident, coincidence the most important sites of resistance to the sus laws, to all types of um, uh, 
systemic ways in which people within the metropole who were racialized a certain way were being suppressed. That is no uh, coincidence. Also, let's not forget that Lancashire, which was the first center of the Industrial Revolution, was dependent on that growth of Liverpool. When we think about Barclays Bank, how can we forget that David and Alexander Barclay, themselves Quakers who you know, claim to have been deeply opposed to the practice of taking human beings as commodities, used the loot from the slave trade to set up Barclays Bank. Lloyd's TSB, as we know it today, went from being a coffee house to becoming one of the world's largest banking institutions through the profit from the slave trade. And when talking about the Industrial Revolution, how can we forget that James Watt, the very inventor who created the steam, uh, steam engine, did it using funding that came from the commodification of human beings. As W.E.B. Du Bois says, the number of persons engaged in the slave trade and the amount of capital embarked in it exceed our powers of calculation. So that's pretty comprehensive. That's a pretty big deal. If we think about decolonizing something like World War I, well, we could talk about how pre-World War I, Britain occupied 12,700,000 miles of the globe. Post-World War I, it occupied 14 million miles of the globe. Important to that was the, fun was the founding of the Anglo-Iranian oil company and the move away from coal to oil um, in order to move their ships and the need to get what the Ottoman Empire occupied at that time. So hence the expansion of the British Empire. But we could also, also talk about how in World War I, India contributed 1.3 million soldiers to the British army and around, it's estimated, 100,000 of them died. Also, it's believed that India contributed about 146 million pounds. In today's money, that would have been 50 billion pounds. Let's not forget that that fantastic dissenter, Bertrand Russell, put it this way. He said, they say they're fighting for democracy. Don't let them hear that in Calcutta and St. Petersburg, where, of course, the autocratic dictatorship that the British were fighting alongside as a cousin of King George um, in, in Russia at that time. Let's not forget that a third of Britain's army in World War I consisted of troops from overseas. But not just that, if we were to decolonize World War I, we would think about the two million laborers who were bought from imperial reaches to act as porters carrying because the Western Front continually went back and forth in, and, 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 and changed in terms of who was where. It needed porters to move equipment from place to place. Often, they would be kidnapped by the other side. Well, those two million porters, out of them, 400,000 of them died in the trenches. And that was a death rate that was bigger than the British soldiers at the Western Front at that time. If we were to attempt to decolonize our understanding of World War II, we would start thinking about the way that one reading of Winston Churchill was that when he became prime minister, he was in a situation where Britain occupied, you know, Britain, the British Empire only didn't occupy at its height 22 nations in the world. So a majority of the world. But he ended World War II with literally the US Army not only occupying former British colonies and British bases, literally slinking directly into where the British Army had been, but even US military in this country. And to this day, we have US military bases here, sometimes masquerading as British military bases. I'm sure near us, we probably have US soldiers in some of these bases around Kent. And that, in some ways, is the legacy of Winston Churchill. But also, we think about the reverse Lend-Lease which in order to repay debts to the US Army, the uh, British government gave the US access to resources in their colonies like tin and rubber um, and other minerals from other places. In terms of the end of World War II and Africa's contribution to Britain's sterling balances, this is taken from uh, Walter R Rodney, um, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa very important reading for all of us 
Um, Britain's uh, sterling balances in 1945, it was 446 million pounds, which by 1955 increased to 1,446 million pounds. More than half of Britain's total gold and dollar reserves were from uh, Africa at that stage. Even we could attempt to decolonize a figure like Clement Attlee. So rather than plainly seeing him uncritically as the person who embraced Keynesian economics, and as reading the book, I learned new stuff about uh, John Maynard Keynes. Not to say that I don't support the idea of counter-cyclical spending on social uh, infrastructure rather than war, but when we look at somebody like Clement Attlee, who embraced that domestically, simultaneous to the founding of the NHS, you had British soldiers posing with heads that they'd cut off of people in the Malayan uprising against the lowering of wages that Britain had imposed upon the rubber workers there in order to repay their debts to the United States. So this is the double face of uh, those who we are encouraged to accept sort of uncritically, such as Clement Attlee. Then it wasn't until the Suez crisis that you saw eventually the world currency switch from pound sterling to the dollar. And that, I'm afraid, was really, that was pretty much it, wasn't it? I mean, we're dealing with the residue of British empire and imperialism today as we speak. It's an imperialism that won't die. You know, Britain is the second largest arms um, exporter in the world, and we're going to get onto that a little bit later and how this university may or may not be implicated in such relationships. But, you know, the move from the dollar being, from the pound being the world's number one uh, currency to the dollar was, was really Suez crisis was where we saw it. Now we're in a situation where of the world's 20 largest growing economies, not one of them is in Europe, a lot of them are former British colonies. Britain is currently the sixth largest economy in the world and is projected by 2000 and uh, over the next 10 to 20 years to become the world's 11th largest economy. What is, how is that going to complicate our ideas of racial hierarchy? How is that going to complicate what we understand to be uh, the, the, the British Empire? Let's not forget, of course, that... Um, we have recently seen a leadership of the Labour Party make arguments that to me, that to me were equal to a form of decolonization, calling for an audit on British colonial legacy, calling for the curriculumization of the British Empire. This was unprecedented in terms of the opportunity that we had. I am, of course, talking about none other than Jeremy Corbyn. And I subjected myself to reading a book called Dangerous Hero by Tim Bauer. I don't suggest it. I don't think it's a good idea. It hurt. I didn't enjoy it. It was a hit piece in every sense of the word. No doubt he drew on a wealth of information from Special Branch to depict Jeremy Corbyn is in as unflattering a light as possible throughout this man's life. Now, one of the things that really fascinated me was he focused on Jeremy's time in Jamaica. Now, when Jeremy was in Jamaica, it just so happened to be the same time that Walter Rodney was there. That's right, the writer of How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Now, what Tim Bauer says in this book is he says, there's no proof that Jeremy Corbyn and Walter Rodney didn't get together to organize politically while they were both in Jamaica. So merely the proximity of the two men was enough to monsterize Jeremy Corbyn. He was near a critical analysis of the development of the economic system in which we live and an understanding of its necro-political consequences merely by his closeness to Walter Rodney. Now that's quite exceptional. In a sense, it was implicitly an understanding that Jeremy Corbyn had of colonialism that made him even more dangerous to the status quo. 
A YouGov poll in 2014 found that 59% of the population here believe the British Empire is something to be proud of. 34% said it would be good if it still existed. And only 19% of the population were ashamed of it. Now, we have seen since the British left India, in less than seven decades, India has become the world's third largest economy. They've sent a spacecraft into the orbit of Mars at the first attempt at something like 10% of the cost of uh, previous attempts by other countries. The Ministry of Defense has had to pay out 22 million pounds to families of Iraqi victims who lost their family members to the British Army after 2003. I'll get onto it in a minute too, but the British government have had to pay over 20 million pounds in compensation to victims in Kenya who suffered in British post-World War II concentration camps, people that suffered castration, people that suffered rape as a, as a, as a weapon of torture, and all manner of unspeakable torture at the hands of the British government who are still alive today. Sir Hilary MacDonald Beckles, a uh, founding member of the United Nations Science Advisory Board on Sustainable Develop Development, said, Britain's preference for a culture of refusal and amnesia in an era of answerability is not sustainable. We look at the uh, example of the Kohinoor diamond when due to public demand and pressure from below, you had uh, the Indian government placing some pressure, mild pressure on the British government. David Cameron said the following, if we say yes to one, you would suddenly find the British Museum empty. You have the reparations commission set up in the Caribbean since 2003, 13, looking for reparations for this unpaid labor. As Arthur Lewis, Nobel laureate in economics, said the matter of 200 years of unpaid slave labor is still to be accounted for. Now the reason why what you are all doing here is on an institutional level combated to some extent is not by accident. It's not down to necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that what happens on the micro is married intimately to what is happening on the macro. And that in fact is a manifestation of what is happening on the macro. Now, the policy of obscuring British colonial history is purposeful and it's established as a governmental policy. How many of us have heard of Operation Legacy? Operation Legacy. Operation Legacy. There's a fantastic book by Ian Cobain called History Thieves, which focuses on this. Now, while uh, the MI5 and GCHQ declassify small and, and uh, rare um, documents, MI6 has never made public any of their documents since they were founded in 1909. Now, what you had developing in the early 2000s was a group of lawyers here, largely from a law firm called Lee Day, working alongside survivors of the camps in Kenya, where people still alive today of our grandparents' generation, possibly, who had uh, all of these memories. And Caroline Elkins had actually covered it in her book, Imperial Reckoning. She'd interviewed a lot of these people. But because there was no document, documentation backing up what she was saying, she was dismissed. And people said, well, there's no way that we can know if this is true that you're saying you know, people were being tortured in such a way in Kenya in the, in the 50s and 60s. Now, as the case progressed, you had a situation where Professor at Oxford University, David Anderson, was going through the documents that were submitted by the British government to look at and study what had happened. And he made the point that it seemed there were 1,500 documents that were missing from the government's documentation. They were referring to documents that just weren't present in what was being made available to uh, the legal team. And so 
what they, what they uh, started to say is they said, well, actually, in 2011, the Foreign Office, we've been holding back some files. You caught us, we've been holding back some files. Okay, okay, here's some files. So they get the new files. David Anderson and, and the rest of the legal team, they go through these documents. They say, hold on, these documents are referencing more documents that we don't have access to. So they went through them again. And then the government admitted that they were holding 8,800 files with hundreds of pages, thousands of pages, from 37 former colonies in Hanslope Park, meaning that the government had their own documents about what the British were doing in 37 different colonies, and they were trying to obscure them. So, Tony Badger from Cambridge uh, University ended up finding that, no, it wasn't 8,800 files. It was, in fact, 20,000 documents that were not present. But it continued. They didn't stop there. And what came out and was revealed was a government policy called Operation Legacy. Now, Operation Legacy was observed by many different departments of government, whereby, at the point of decolonization, documents would either be taken back to Britain or they would be burnt or they would be uh, strapped to bricks and taken into the sea and dropped as far away from the shore as possible. So there were four criteria for the obscuring of these documents, according to the British government. The first criteria was if they may embarrass Her Majesty's government. The second criteria if they may embarrass the police or military forces. The third criteria, if they may compromise sources of intelligence. And the fourth criteria, if they might be used unethically by future governments. Meaning, unethical use by future governments would be using it to bring cases against the British government in order to win compensation. So what happened eventually for those people from Kenya was they won 19.9 million pounds, but that was for 5,228 victims, translating to about 3,800 pounds each. So that's severely limited in terms of a win, but as a legal precedent, that was very, very important. The Commonwealth Office memo regarding Operation Legacy stated it in this way. The fact is we have always, the fact we, ha it has always been British policy to withdraw or destroy certain sensitive records prior to independence. It has never been advertised or generally admitted. The reply we give to, Ke to Kenya could affect the treatment of records and files withdrawn from other colonial tendencies. To this day, we seem to only have five boxes of documents on Aden in Yemen. There are no British documents on Guyana, and where, of course, we know that a democratically elected government was overthrown in 1953 by a Labour government. Much of this missing material, there's no explanation for it. It's said by witness accounts that at the partition of India in 1947, there was a great cloud of smoke gathered above Delhi from where the documents were burning. A correspondent in Jerusalem, in Palestine, also said, the burning of documents is progressing satisfactorily. So what we see there is a clear British government policy to obscure what happened then. Now, what initiatives like this are about is making that visible. The process of making that visible is not only understanding the history of the world and global history, not only understanding it on a personal level, it's understanding Britain's history. It's adding something to this society which has taken so much from the rest of the world. And the important thing about this initiative, and thank you so much to Dave and everybody else involved in, in bringing me here, it's an honor to be here, is that it involves in a really intimate and clear way the lecturers and the students. And it's not necessarily lecturer-led, but it involves 
all parts of this, and it's creating a, a, a new form of interaction and culture on the basis of decolonial politics. What I would argue is the sharpest end of Britain's colonial melancholia, as Paul Gilroy calls it, is the Ministry of Defense. It's the Ministry of Defense today. It's BAE systems. Britain, despite the fact it's the sixth largest economy, is the second largest exporter of arms in the world, second only to the United States. Two thirds of its weapons go to the Gulf, a huge proportion of them go to Saudi Arabia, engaged in the bombing of Yemen, sporadically now, but for a few years, continuously, some of the poorest people in the world on the receiving end of Brit British weapons. That has also included the participation of British military personnel in the aiming of that equipment. Our understanding of decolonial politics has to, has to spread out to what the state does and the way in which the institution that we may or may not be a part of is uh, implicated into it. So in 2018 and 2019, each year 15,000 soldiers quit the British Army. Now this is seen as big time crisis mode. They're in crisis. They are really seriously in crisis right now. They see this as a 10% fall in troops year after year as a major issue. Let's not forget, it's because of colonialism that one in 10 British soldiers is a foreign national. There is a crisis in which people are not joining the British Army at the level in which it feels it needs to have them. Um, you know, and Britain, according to Mark Curtis, is involved in seven covert wars around the world, from Syria to Iraq to Reaper drones in Afghanistan to Libya, Yemen, Pakistan, and Somalia. In order to combat this, as they see it, terrible situation, they have a massive budget set aside to put the British Army in schools. So simultaneous to the prevent program, meaning that if a person thinks critically about British foreign policy, they enter the pre-criminal space, potentially stepping onto a conveyor belt towards political violence. Despite the fact that according to Mark Hunter, um, expert on terrorism within the British Army, your chances of being anywhere near terrorism or an act of political violence are one in 16 million in this country. The conveyor belt that's being set up by the Ministry of Defense is one which aims to take people directly from school into the British military. And nowhere is that sharper and more um, pronounced than in universities. And what you will all probably be interested to know, some of you may already know, is that in Kent University, there's pretty serious bonds. So as of 2014, the British Army's program to develop technologies of psychological warfare, quote unquote, emerging technologies such as social media and psychological techniques can be harnessed by the military to influence people's beliefs. So the information that came out about this program um, was largely through a Freedom of Information Act, which uh, made clear that they were developing programs that could uh, essentially have bots online targeting people to influence patterns of behavior as it was put. Now, the programs would develop virtual, there's something similar to what they call virtual um, assistance on uh, retailers' websites, whereby you have a screen popping up suggesting things, merely through suggestion trying to make you buy something. But what that was being developed for was for making you think things that the British military want you to think about what's going on in the world, about possibly what's happening domestically, though that is generally not what the British Army is meant to be doing. And so what happened was uh, two pieces of funding were directed towards Kent University for this purpose. Number one, 310,000 uh, pounds, uh, a project called Cognitive and Behavior Concepts of Cyber Activities was not only delivered by Bain's associates, it was also delivered by Kent University 
and uh, Uni University College London. Another part of that funding in 2014 was quote unquote innovation tools and techniques for influence activities and it was around 30,000 pounds that was directed by the Ministry of Defense to Kent University to work on influencing people's uh, activities. We look at 2018, uh, an important program that is potentially going to see British troops uh, having brain scanners monitoring their state of mind. Now, ostensibly, this is stated to improve the mental health for British soldiers, but you can bet that this is about avoiding 15,000 British soldiers leaving the army on a yearly basis. And those brain scanners, and the money for those brain scanners that Kent University has received is almost 300,000 pounds. That will include um, trials with the RAF to counter fatigue that would be experienced by pilots, and also to work on uh, multitasking for soldiers. And as was stated on the MOD's website, it will provide the MOD with more robust tools which can be used across many uh, commands. Interesting. Another way in which Kent University is entrenched into what the British Army is doing is through the University Officer Training Corps, which are a reserve organization which cannot be deployed to war at any point, but they, um, over three years of their time in university, can train with the uh, British Army. And they have a Canterbury detachment which um, specifically targets to recruit from Canterbury Christchurch University and University of Kent. And on a smaller but still significant le uh, level is the sponsorship of employability uh, point schemes. So not only do you have uh, BAE Systems sponsoring uh, the point schemes, they have a graduate development program which acts as a conveyor belt to take somebody directly from your classroom next to you to a military base in Saudi Arabia where they will be helping with the targeting and reconnaissance missions um, uh, around the Saudi Arabian um, army and their targeting of some of the poorest people in the world. You also have the Ministry of Defense involved in the employability point schemes through the Defense um, Science and Technology Laboratory. And so that is really responsible for working on the technological advancements um, in the MOD. So that's quite a lot of work. That's quite a lot of work. You're talking about an institution that in terms of its role in the rest of the world, the way that it affects other people through using the expertise that people are developing here, through using, frankly, genius. You know, Eisenhower, who, you know, uh, a wrong clock is right twice a day. He said something amazing. He said, every single time a fighter jet is built, that is when medical equipment is not being given to somebody who needs it. You know, he coined the term, term the military industrial complex. And that's what this is part of. This is part of the service of knowledge, of genius, of expertise to killing and taking life. And that, to me, Combating that relationship is as decolonial as we can possibly get. Being willing to challenge that relationship between an institution like the University of Kent and the Ministry of Defense, between an institution like the University of Kent and uh, BAE Systems, this is really putting your finger on the uh, proverbial button, as it were. And this is what I would argue we should always try and push our um, movements for decolonization within universities to look directly at what is happening there. If you think about how much money is worth, that money is worth to the institution in very raw and crude neoliberal terms, 300,000 pounds maybe in one year. Maybe if we were to look at the entire stage and think as economic units, what you mean to this university. You know, it's about trying to apply that pressure to these levers of power 
um, within the institutions to change those policies. So um, what I will do, just before we'll watch um, a video of mine, if that's okay, is just do um, a poem that um, Mr. Dave Thomas, please make some noise for Dave Thomas, please. <laughs> make some noise for all of the academics involved in tonight. Um, make some noise for the people that are going to clean up this place afterwards as well, and the people working on the lights and working on the sound also. So, this is um, taken from a, a piece of mine called Let Letter to the 1%, and this is how it goes. Power to those that read bell hooks, power to those that sell books, power to those that know how the inside of a cell looks, or those feeling helpless, forgotten or discarded, power to the strange fruit they thought was rotten in the garden, power to those sitting alone, seeking solace in the calmness, power to those feeling stained, that your tomorrow isn't tarnished, power to those that sweep the streets with more knowledge than PhDs, power to those that keep their keys, return as promised, please believe, power to those that suffer in silence, those it hurts to hear, power to those that hold their ground, power to those that persevere, power to those that love humanity more than they love style, power to immigrants probably raising Donald Trump's child, power to the blind who can't imagine what sight is, power to those staring at the moon and all those working night shifts, power to the readers, the writers, the illiterate, power to those that struggle to decolonize their syllabus, power to the shy ones who always struggle to make friends and the half of humanity worth less than eight men, power to those that risk their life to dig the colton from the ground for the mic I'm spitting on and the phone you're holding now, power to those that built the stadium they're playing in, power to those that mowed the grass and stitched the ball that they're playing with, power to every rapper that doesn't rap about killing, power to the builders who build buildings that outlive them, power to the slaves of ancient Greece that never had the right to vote. Democracy dead like Gary Webb when they import it like his coke. Power to those that write to prison. Power to those writing home. Power to those writing poems. Power to those that died alone. Power to Curtis Mayfield. Power to Ronald Isley. Power to the fishermen that were forced into piracy. Power to every person that is working in the library. Power to every nurse that we turn to in our times of need. Power to the unions and the miners that are punished. Power to those that drive the buses and those that collect the rubbish. Power to the youth desiring the truth. And power to every rapper that is dying for a fire in the boat booth for those that lost limbs to King Leopold's quota and those risking their lives for the P&O to Dover power to union leaders murdered by Power to victims of this globalized Cosa Nostra. Power to those dying on the shores and the borders. Power to human beings that were rendered fauna and flora. Power to those that clean up after the stage show. And carnival goers still haunted by Kelso Cole Crane's ghost. Power to Kevin Carter, his, his picture taunts us ever after. So many questions never answered. Remember the last words of Abdul Muhsin al Sa'dun al Ummat and Tadr al Khidm al Inglis, La Yuafakun, power to Al Jawahari and his rebellions. They killed his brother Jafar and he cursed the rotten Thamesians. Enlightened despots pursuing tactics Machiavellian. Chinese steel preceded Europe a millennium. Think about it. Printed press half a millennium. You'll never get close. Power to Ken Loach and every volunteer in Lesbos. Cuban doctors sent to Sri Lanka for the tsunami. Power to those that cleaned up after the Bullingdon parties. Kids knowing Apple products before they know what an Apple is forgotten like passengers on the USS Indianapolis dying days before they could see what little boys damage did on the precipice of fascism while passiveness is cancerous. Power to those strong enough to dream and power to those that chose not to be a cog in the machine. Power to those that love first and hate never. Power to those that sleep on the streets through grey weather. Power to Aziz Ali, Bone Thugs and Harmony. Power to Norman Baker. David Kelly's own artery, power to the genocided population of Tasmania. The internet descends to Trumptastic Fantasia. Let them try to quote this. You'll never find a better diagnosis than collective psychosis. It's getting quite hopeless, but hope is all we have. Trying to cultivate the positive, not focus on the bad, but the globe's under attack. The obnoxious rage of a fake intellectual, amazing grace in the age of the spectacle. Not the first time they found a racist electable to raise to the pedestal and desecrate the place that translated the decimal. I don't want to tempt fate. Power to corpse washers like Salvador Allende. Power to language learners from Bernie Sanders fans to flag burners. One man's inertia is another man's purpose. In the utopia of song, we are victorious. But the bittersweet reality is not this glorious. Power to Coltrane watching Malcolm X. Power to Paul Robeson under house arrest. Power to Galileo under house arrest. Power to Ibn Haytham under house arrest. Forgive me if I sound obsessed. Forgive me if I sound depressed. Believe me, that's not how it's meant. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think if we're going to be able to, we're just going to play um, a video of mine.
called Ghost of Grenfell, what I would encourage everyone to do is understand that in London, in North Kensington, in Latimer Road, we are dealing with a struggle against some of the largest construction companies in the world. Francis Wallace Grenfell was a British colonial officer who killed people for Britain in Egypt and in Sudan. Grenfell Tower was named after him. Arconic, the company that made the P.E. Rennebond cladding, f uh, six millimeters of polyethylene in the middle of it, they also make the F-35 fighter jet, which has been sold to the Israeli government and has already been used in uh, attacks. We have to understand that if we're going to draw the line of colonialism around Grenfell, it's not going to be based on aesthetics. It's not going to be based on the way that people in the building look. It's going to be based on what the company that is responsible for it through their cladding that was flammable is also doing around the world in terms of violence towards people. So please watch this video. Please get involved in the campaign. We have a silent walk around the community on the 14th of every month. Please get involved. Come to London if you can and, um, and do it and support us in what we're doing. This is the song Ghost of Grenfell. Thank you. The night our eyes changed. Rooms where love was made and unmade in a flash of the night. Rooms where memories drowned in fumes of poison. Rooms where futures were planned and the imagination of children built castles in the sky. Rooms where both the extraordinary and the mundane were lived, become forever tortured graves of ash. Oh, you political class, so servile to corporate power. To begin though, 1 30 a.m. Heard the shouting from my window. People crying in the street, watching the burning of their kinfolk. Grenfell Tower now, historically a symbol. People reaching from the windows, screaming for their lives, pleading with their cries, trying to reason with the skies. They all youth birth champions. Comparison is clear though, that every single person in that building was a hero. So don't judge our tired eyes in these trying times Cause we've been breathing in cyanide the entire night They say Yasin saw the fire and he ran inside Who thought that would be the site where he and his family died The street is like a graveyard, tombstone lurching over us No shouting out to their windows, now wish they never woke them up Wouldn't hope your worst enemy to go in this position Now it's flowers for the dead and printing posters for the missing Come home, come home Justice, not hear him, not hear him scream. The day die your us, the day die your us, the day die for us. This group of man slaughter will haunt you, not hear him scream. See trauma in the faces of all those that witness this innocence in the faces of all those on the missing list. See hopes unfulfilled, ambitions never achieved. No, I'm not the only one that sees the dead in my dreams. Strive for the bravery of Yasin, artistic gift of Khadija. Every person a unique blessing to never be repeated. Strive for the loyalty of siblings that stay behind with their parents. Pray that every loved one lost can somehow make an appearance. We are like the last conversation with their dearest until we face what they face. We will never know what fear is. We are for survival. It was rehoused in the best place not to be left Sleeping in the West Way for ten days with For arrests made and debts paid and true numbers known For the families who kept faith with For safety and homes and love They are immortalized forever The only ghosts are us, I wonder Justice, not hear him, not hear him scream. The day die your us, the day die your us, the day die for us. This group of man slaughter will haunt you, not hear him scream. I'm
To whom it may concern at the Queen's Royal Borough of Kensington in Chelsea. Where is Yasin al Wahhabi? Where is his brother Mehdi? Where is his sister Nur Huda? Where is their mother? And where is their father? Where is Nura Jamal? Where is her husband Ashi? Where is their children? Yahya, Firdaus, and Yaqub. Where is Nadir Ubaidah? Where is Steve Power? Where is Dennis Power? Where is Marco Gotardi? Where is Gloria Trevisan? Where is Amal and her daughter Amaya? Where is Mohammed Nader? Where is Ali Omar Jafari? Where is Khadija Sayy? Where is Maryam El Gawari? Where is her mother Sua? Tell us, tell us, tell us. Where is Rania Ibrahim and her two daughters? Where is Jessica Ubanur Ramirez? Where is Deborah Lampra? Where is Mohammed Al Hajj Ali? Where is Nadia? Where is her husband Basim? Where are her daughters? Mina, Fatima, and Zaina, and their grandmother. Where is Zainab Deen? And son Jeremiah. Where is Ligaya Where is she? Where, Where is Mohammed Noor Tuku? Where is Tony Dizzy? Where is Maria Baz? Where is Fataya El Sanusi? Where is her son Abu Faraz? Her daughter, Ezra. Where is Lucas J? Where is Farah Hamdan? Where is Omar Belkadi? Where is their daughter, Lina? Where is Hamid Khani? Where is Hesham Ram? Where is Raymond Bernard? Where is Isaac Powell? Where is Marjorie Vital? Where is your son? Where is Kumromia? Where is his wife, Raz? Where are their children, Abdul Hanif? Abdul Hamid and Hosna. Where are Sakina and Fatima? Where is Burki Habtoum and her son, Baru? Tell us, tell us, tell us. Where is Stefan and Tim? Where is Abdel Salam? Where is Abdel Salam? Where are these people? Where are these people? There'll be ashes on your graves Like a phoenix we will rise The blood is on your hands There'll be ashes on your graves Like a phoenix we will rise Give it up for Loki, everyone! Thank you so much, Loki. Be, keep being you. Allahu alim. We need people like you to keep us focused and keep fighting the fight. Well, those lights are bright. Okay, so um, this, as you'll have seen from the projections, has been a journey. A journey for all of us. Not just about today. It's been two years and many years before that in the running. Along that journey, many people have supported us and made what we've come together and been able to do together today happen. All the people behind the scenes, I want to thank our funders, the people who've done all the logistics, Zoe and Tina in particular, the Gulbenkian and Oliver, who's behind, been behind this project and supported us, Karan Javeri and his team, who've been doing the filmmaking, the Building the Anti-Racist Classroom Collective, we have Debs and Angela here on the side, who started, who've been with us for the last year, who were at the conference last year, who started off the day with an embodied workshop, embodied writing workshop with the students, helping them, empowering them to find their voices and um, feel confident and empowered to be able to speak up when necessary. Personal thanks, obviously, to Sweater, who did an amazing job at facilitating the conversation. For me personally, Dave and Barbara, big shout out to them. <laughs> Staff at the University of Kent, along with me, who've managed to work with the students in what has been a truly, truly uh, amazing privilege to work in this student staff collaboration and I hope if there are other staff from other universities and this one that you can see what can happen with that kind of collaboration as Loki said. Loki also mentioned the book 
The book is a work uh, that was meant to be launched today, and it develops the work from the manifesto, copies of which are here. Um, but we will be launching it. It's somewhat delayed because of the industrial action, and we will be launching it on uh, May the 20th, we hope. So do keep a track on social media of what's happening there and when we're going to be launching it. My main thanks, though, obviously, obviously, <laughs> is to the amazing, amazing students. I actually, uh, if I don't get overly emotional, couldn't do this without them. They are the ones that have kept us going. Is that not right, Dave, Barbara, and all the other staff? So I know you're going to laugh at me, but here's some words. I'm dropping a verse, people. <laughs> As you said, you are our present, you are our future. You are rising, remember to lift. You are not a stat, you are not a gap, and you are not an asset. You are empowered, awesome people. You are the university, you are my university. Give it up for the students and Loki!